Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. Thank you, Shai. Um, I'll talk about CSR. In particular, Shai has asked me to talk about um, not quite starting the company, but uh, what we did once we started and the sort of things that we thought were important. Um, just to remind you, um, CSR is a company that um, started in Cambridge um, five years before we floated on the China Stock Exchange. Uh, started in April '99, and uh, we raised um, a total of $85 million before we floated. We've now floated, and uh, we're a company on the London Stock Exchange with a market cap of about um, £1 billion, pounds around about, and turnover of about um, £600, uh, $700 million per year. And in fact, there were nine founders of CSR, and indeed none of us um, at that time had actually started a company. Uh, we had worked in small companies, and indeed had worked in large companies, but we hadn't actually started a company until then. So, starting a business, um, art or science, uh, I think the thing to um, bear in mind when we're starting a, a company is that it isn't um, deterministic. Um, many things will go right, but on the other hand, many things will go wrong. Uh, one key, very, very important thing that I'll come to a little later is the business plan. And that isn't just the business plan that you start with in order to raise the money, but it's actually the business plan that you carry through with and helps you run the company um, as you proceed. I'll come back to that. Um, Isabel will talk about intellectual property. Actually, um, that's one of the uh, questions that comes up most often when people come um, to investors with plans. Uh, the question is, who owns the intellectual property? Or indeed, is there any protectable intellectual property? Um, if there isn't, uh, it's a little more difficult to make for success. It's still possible. And the market goes to the swift. Those who um, get out with the product first into the market um, are often the winners. But if you can protect your intellectual property, that makes a big difference, of course. Um, I won't dwell on this slide. Uh, there's just one word on the second bullet, implementation, and um, two words, execution. Those are probably the most important words um, you have to bear in mind as you're running your company. Um, because not only do you develop your business plan, you raise your money, but um, you then have to execute according to business plan. You have to deliver according to the goals and the milestones that you've set out at the beginning. And this is very, very serious. Um, we could you know, have a whole lecture on setting goals and setting objectives and setting milestones. But of course, you have to set them such that you have a reasonable chance of meeting them. Um, there's nothing that uh, makes investors lose faith more in a company than a company that set five objectives over the first year and a half and hasn't met any of them. Find early customers, very important. Um, again, you don't have to, in fact, you rarely do <coughs> have revenue uh, when you start a company, but you have to know how that company will generate funds, will generate money, will sell a product to customers. And if you don't know that, um, you shouldn't expect anybody to actually fund you. And again, I do see a number of business plans where people say, you know, we've got a good product, or we will have a good product, uh, we've got the market for it, we'll sell it two or three years from now, and uh, basically, in effect, we'll have the best. And that's not good enough. Um, the business plan, uh, as I say, of course you develop this before you raise your money, and these are the, you know, um, shuffle them around a bit maybe, but pretty much the things that you have to address. But not only that when you're raising the money, but subsequently when you're actually running the business, uh, the market will develop. Um, actually, it's very clear to, to, to me that um, you, although you can predict the market to a certain extent, um, you can't predict over a period of two, three, four years how it will evolve. And all you need to do really is to make sure that you're in the right position at the right time to tackle those market opportunities as they evolve um, because uh, they're not deterministic and things will change as you go along. Um, what I mean by two, the offering and the ambition, um, is that um, you need to offer something. Come back to the business model, whether it's a product or service or the license of intellectual property. Um, uh, and ambition, you know, do be ambitious. If you're not ambitious, there's no reason why anybody should fund your company. Um, if you expect a lifestyle business, you know, if you 
by drawing on up your business plan, if you're expecting to take you know, full holidays for the first couple of years, nobody will be interested in funding or sticking with you. Um, you have to work very hard, you have to give up a lot um, to be a successful entrepreneur. I'll come back to the business model. Um, just a point on the management team. Um, you don't have to have a full management team when you start. Um, you must do a little analysis, uh, uh, see what gaps are missing. You know, are you lacking in finance or marketing or indeed sales? Um, hopefully, particularly around here, you'll be pretty okay with technology and experience with um, uh, using technology to create products or services. Um, but nobody expects you to have a full management team when you actually come out with your business plan. And constitution of the board, we can talk about that a little later, but that is very, very important. And the fact that you have a board, particularly you've thought about what your board will look like when you're um, proposing your business plan, is very important. And really what's most important is, um, is, is, is you as founders on the board, perhaps larded with a, a bit of extra skill and experience. But you don't need to put um, you know, four MBEs and five professors on the board to impress investors, because that, that by itself won't impress <coughs> investors. Um, people you've worked with, perhaps in the university, to, um, to do what you um, want to do, you know, add them by all means, but um, you don't need to um, suck the board with uh, um, the good and the great to start with. Valuation, um, that again is a, is a lecture, is a talk all by itself, um, because uh, you will find when you produce your business plan, when you have some idea of revenue, um, you know, you've probably all seen Dragon's Den. Um, you say you want to raise half a million, 100,000, maybe 1 million pounds, and the, the investors will say, okay, what's your company worth? And if you say, company's worth 2 million, they give you a million because they end up with 50% of the company. Uh, and that may be right. But the bottom line on valuation, um, although you can read books on it, and there are lots of learning papers on it, it's like selling a second-hand car. Um, you need competition, you need lots of people willing to give you money, and then you'll get a good price for it. Um, if, if there's only one outfit, one VC that you're chasing, um, he can determine the price, and you don't want that. So um, if you want to talk about valuation, if you're close to it, let, let's have a chat. But basically, bottom line is, company's worth what you can get for it. Um, business model, um, there are a number of business models. I mentioned products, services, license of intellectual property. The only thing you need to be very, very clear about as you're developing your plan, and in particular as you're running your business, is um, what is that model? Be clear about it and stick to it, at least until you've shown that it, it does or it doesn't work. And, um, you know, again, I come across a number of companies with business plans that says we'll sell some consulting, we'll develop a product, and by the way, we'll license the intellectual property. There's no way you can do all three of those things um, out of a small company initially. You might be able to do two, uh, because you should, you should certainly focus on doing one very well. Um, as I say, we raised $85 million worth of funding, and we did the first round. Round one there was two local companies, Herman Houses and the and 3i. Uh, we raised um, £6 million pounds initially, and um, if you're going for an angel round, of course, you'll be looking at raising maybe 100000 maybe two, three hundred thousand 300000 pounds. Um, and there is a you know, a good number of angels, there are a good number of groups of people who will fund those sort of companies here in Cambridge. So Cambridge is a great place to be to, to, to raise money. Um, we're also the game, I think I've mentioned a few of these. Um, you know, there are actually quite a few lifestyle businesses around, and uh, nobody likes funding lifestyle businesses. If investors fund a company, they want to see the people work very, very hard to make them money and indeed make the investors money. Um, raising sufficient capital, um, that's a, a British disease, unfortunately, is not raising enough money to fund the company through its difficult early days. And we often find that for uh, comparable companies, those in America are often better funded than those in the UK, uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, but do make sure, if you can, um, you match the raising of the capital with the valuation of the company. I mean, the bottom line is, as you proceed, as you get revenue, as you make a name for yourself, the valuation of the company rises. Therefore, as you raise money, as that valuation rises, you give away less of the company. And don't strive for perfection. Um, again, I see that a lot. Um, you know, quite often, the American approach with products seems to be get out there first. Doesn't matter if the product doesn't work superbly, um, create the market share and get it right afterwards. I think we tend to polish a little too much here in this country. 
and of course persevere. Um, culture of innovation, very important, can do approach, you know, uh, I'm sure you've all been through this, but you know, try and think if you have a problem, the answer is yes, how do you solve it, rather than think of the 55 reasons uh, why it is a problem and why you won't be able to uh, achieve what you want to achieve. Um, strong team of CSI and R had nine founders, um, that was maybe, you know, in theory a little too many, um, certainly one is too few. Doing this by yourself is very, very lonely. You need two or three of your shoulders to cry on and people to encourage you. Um, so the answer is between you know, one and nine, maybe. And uh, willingness to make a big cake, um, that is raise sufficient money quickly in order to get to market and uh, be a success. And um, again, you know, look at your market, your available market. Um, if it's a global market, as indeed most of them are these days, go for the global market. Nobody's interested in funding companies that are just looking at the UK, which indeed at the end of the day is a very, very small market uh, for most products in world terms. And again, these last two, the key words, reliable execution and be very, very focused. There are lots of things you can do, but you know you have to stop doing a good number of things in order to be focused on the, um, the thing that's very important for your company, the business model, and getting that product out there in the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> great thing about Cambridge is that we do have role models. Um, indeed, we had them at CSR. You know, we were able to look at people we knew in ARM and say, look, those guys um, started ARM. Uh, they made a lot of money for themselves and their shareholders. They're no different to us. If they can do it, we can. And uh, as the years have gone by, we have a, a, a lot of very good examples of people who've done that uh, around the Cambridge area. And uh, um, you know, that's really what you need, somebody to not copy, um, but to say, they like me, they've done it, therefore I can do it. Business model, very important. Um, I've said all those things, I think, really. Execution, bottom line there is, uh, is everything. So I'll stop there, and um, Isabel and I will be very, very pleased to um, take questions afterwards. Thank you. interesting side of being an entrepreneur and running a business. I guess my job here tonight is to be a bit of a boring lawyer and talk about some of the, the, the downsides, the responsibilities of running a business. Um, I did notice that um, on Phil's last slide, one of the things he didn't mention was speak for a lawyer. So I hope by the end of this evening you'll bear that in mind. Um, because, as I say, my role is accountable. To, to make you think about responsibilities. Because when you run a business, there are lots of duties and liabilities that you're quite likely to take on board. And I'm, in this respect, I'm talking about things that are other than just pure financial duties and responsibilities. So one of the first things I'd like to do this evening is talk about limited liability. Really, I'd like to debunk the myth of limited liability. Because there's very much a feeling that goes around that you know, if you and your mate want to set up a limited liability company, if things go wrong, if things go pear-shaped, then um, you personally don't incur any liability for any of the debts of the company. And if things go wrong, you and your mate can walk off into the sunset whistling a happy tune. Well, that's not the case at all. It's far, um, if you like, it's the other end of the spectrum. So apart from, let's say, a cowboy builder who's just doing everything in cash, you could perhaps get away with that sort of thing. You are going to incur liabilities in your position as a director, as a person running a business. And this sort of situation has partly arisen because of all the sort of well-known examples of corporate collapse that we've all heard about in the last few years, you know, good old Enron. Um, okay, Enron happened in the States, but it's cast its shadow over UK law as well. And this year, UK Parliament is bringing into, um, into our legislation an act called the Companies um, Act 90, uh, sorry, well, centric, perhaps there's older, uh, Companies Act 2007, which sets out the duties of directors, i.e. what directors must legally do. 
This is a huge piece of legislation. In fact, it is the largest piece of legislation ever enacted by our parliament in the UK. So that goes to show how important the government feels regulating what companies can and can't do, what you, what you when you start a company and run a company, can and can't do is. In fact, one of my colleagues was telling me the other day that apparently if you print out the whole act, together with all the sort of schedules and bits and bobs that go with it. The special <coughs> paper, and this is on ordinary A4, ordinary font size, will be over two metres high. So I don't suggest you go and do it when you get home, but it, it just, just give you a scale. So I'm just going to sort of highlight a few little things for this evening. Um, but director's duties is one of the, the main focuses of the Act. Because what that act does is bring in a duty on all directors to act in a way that they consider in good faith is to be the most likely to promote the success of the company um, having regard to all the interests of the members of that company. So all directors now have to act in good faith and every time they make a decision, they have to think, ah, oh, is this decision going to promote the best, in is this likely to be the best decision to promote the best interest of the company? And the act in question lays down a list of, sort of non-exclusive factors that you as directors are going to have to take into account when you're making decisions. And those factors are things such as you've got to take into account the interests of your employees, You've got to take into account the need to foster good relationships with suppliers and customers. You've got to take into account the interests of the environment and the community. <coughs> so obviously as a director, you wouldn't be printing out the, uh, the relevant app because that's not going to help the environment. Um, you've got to take into account um, the interests of all the members of a, as a whole of the business. So there's a huge list of factors that you've got to consider when you're making decisions. We don't yet know in practice what that's going to mean. We're waiting for more guidance as to how, how you as a director are going to have to do that. But at the very least, it's going to mean when you're making decisions, you're going to have to start documenting the fact that you, you know, if you like, you tick the boxes, you thought, aha, right, I thought about the environment, I thought about the community, I thought about my employees, now I'll go on and, and make the decision. Because that's the other thing that the act in question brings into being. It's um, it was described in the House of Lords as introducing a double whammy, uh, this expression the House of Lords don't use very often, but what they meant was not only does it introduce this whole new concept of liability for directors, it also enables shareholders who think the director hasn't acted in that way, hasn't taken into account the environment when making that decision, they can sue the director personally for that breach of duty. So you know, things, things are going to get more difficult um, in theory anyway. And so as directors in a company, you're going to be really needing to think about issues such as liability. And so for example, You'd want to ensure, if you're a director of a company, that you have a contract, a director's service agreement with that company uh, so that they would indemnify you and provide insurance in case a shareholder sees you. So you know, it, it's, you know, it's a sort of piece of paper that at the time when you're setting up a company and we're all in that position, you know, you've got all the excitement and the business plan, investors running in and out, but you know, you've got to think of those basic things. The other aspect I wanted to highlight, um, without sounding too much like a prophet doom all the time, <coughs> is shareholders agreement. Now again, this is something that's often overlooked when people are, are setting up a company. Um, but what I want to get across is the fact that you know, it's, it's much better to spend your money on getting the agreements in place at the start of the business, at the start of your entrepreneurial career, rather than wasting money on lawyers trying to sort out a mess if, if things go wrong. Um, and I like to think about shareholders' agreements as being a bit like prenuptial agreements. 
Um, you need to think about things when you're all happy, when you and your mates are sitting around over a cup of coffee working out who's doing what in the company, who's going to have what size of share, um, rather than sorting it out when there's a huge divorce and everyone's going off to their own cons uh, corner consulting lawyers. Because what a shareholders agreement is, is a contract, an agreement between the shareholders that sets out their rights between themselves. So it deals with the number of shares, which is the sort of thing you'd be thinking about anyway. So if you're getting friends and family and angels to put the money into the company, it's very <coughs> easy to say who's going to have how many shares. But what a shareholders agreement does is say, oh yes, we accept how many shares you can have, but what can you do with them? For example, if the business isn't doing too well, and somebody, one of the shareholders, wants to sell their shares, can they do that? Can they sell them to any third party? If you're a small company, you might not want them to sell to any third party. You might want to force them to offer them to the other shareholders first. Equally, if the business is doing well and an investor wants to come in and put more money into the business, and one of the shareholders is a keen on that investor, can you force them to sell their shares to you if they don't want to carry on? So as I say, it, it's another piece of paper, I'm afraid, but it's another one that's going to give you protection in running your business. The last area I want to touch on is IP ownership, which is a subject dear to my heart. And I was very pleased to, to see the prominence that, that Phil gave it earlier. I think the problem with IP, intellectual property, is, is its name. Because the word intellectual is kind of slightly off-putting. I don't know what word is it. It's touchy feeling stuff. I can't get a hold of it. I think that's the wrong way to think about intellectual property. It's really important to think about it as a physical asset in the same way as any other asset you might have, like your car, your house, or the other kind of property. And as Phil says, the fundamental question that everyone is going to be looking at who wants to invest in your company is going to be the question of who owns the intellectual property. So it's absolutely vital that that's sorted out right at the very beginning. And it's one of those things that it, it sounds, sounds quite straightforward. Well, hey, I came up with the idea, surely I own it. Well, that's all very well in theory, but, but for a lot of you in sort of like situations where you might be part student, part business person, part doing a bit of work on the side, you've got to ensure that the ideas that you're going to be using to take your company forward are the ideas that you own and aren't owned by, say, the university or that company that you were doing a bit of work for at the weekend. Because that's where things go terribly wrong. The most important thing to appreciate about intellectual property is that the person who creates the work in question, who comes up with the, the design of a brochure, who comes up with a new piece of software, comes up with a new chemical formulation, is the person that owns the rights in that intellectual property. Now what the law says is if an employee comes up with an intellectual property in the course of their employment, if they create the work in the course of their employment, then the law would generally, generally speaking say that the employer automatically owns that intellectual property. You don't actually need anything in writing, but I can say that it's good to get your writing anyway. But when you're an early stage company, I was still was saying earlier, you, you can't afford to have lots of employees. You, you're going to have to shepherd your resources as, you know, as, as tightly as you can. So you, you often will be tempted to start outsourcing things. So the design of your website, uh, the design of some software that's going to work with your particular application, application um, you know, some laboratory work perhaps. Perhaps to the, the very students that you are yourself, you'll be giving them some money in years to come, hopefully. It's absolutely vital that if you're going to do that, you get something in writing ensuring that you own the IP, because otherwise, they will own the IP. 
unless you've got something in writing to the contrary. And it's not just small startup businesses that make most mistakes. Huge multinational businesses do that as well. I, I once acted for a very well-known sports shoe company um, that was going to go public, going to be listed on the London Stock Exchange. And the whole thing about the sports shoe was, as you'll know better than I, it was all about the brand of the trainers in question, and it had a little logo on the side, and it, all those logos are the simplest things in the world, aren't they? And they're nothing exciting. But when the investors were examining the company, doing their due diligence before it floated, they discovered that the logo in question had been designed 20 years ago by a guy in China, and there was no documentation to prove that my clients owned that logo. And the whole float was nearly pulled 10 days before it was about to go ahead. And we then spent those 10 days rushing around with um, the imagined detective agencies and that sort of thing, private investigators, trying to track down this, this guy who didn't realize how important he was for the, the whole, uh, whole huge business. And as you can imagine, my clients ended up having paid quite a large sum of money because we were somewhat against the clock and um, it was easier to pay them than argue. But that, that's one huge example, but there's lots of smaller examples where that sort of thing has gone wrong. So, so that's a very sort of quick gamble through some of the issues I think are, are, are relevant to starting off with the business. And there's, there's a lot more uh, documentation that, um, that a, a business ideally needs um, at the beginning. I think Shire has put on the handouts a mention of um, Launchpad, which is a, a hopefully user-friendly guide to starting a business that my firm has produced. It's available on the internet, so feel free to, um, to log on to our website to access that, because it, it walks you through the sort of issues that um, some of the things that we're talking about, but also in greater detail, um, and many others as well. Too. Yes, I think it was manager and technical. I mean, we spun out of a local company, Cambridge Consultants, and uh, we were, we are all engineers. But some of the ones with um, grey hairs and maybe, maybe no hairs at all, um, you know, have uh, had uh, more perhaps sales and marketing. Uh, experience, um, even though in our dim and distant past we developed things. So the way we um, started CSR is we had three founding directors, uh, with me as managing director, um, another guy as technical director, and another as um, marketing director, and um, the other six were founding engineers, and um, we defined the roles quite clearly in that way. And when we came to the VCs, we said, look, you know, here we are, uh, we're lacking certain skills, we know um, not as much about manufacturing chips as we should, and uh, we don't know as much about finance as we should, although you know, we'd all run spreadsheets and dabble at being uh, financiers. Um, so, you know, it, it just happened in a way, um, and it seemed um, that that was the, the, the best group to start the company, because we, in effect we were taking a fair amount of um, intellectual property from Cambridge Consultants, and uh, the lawyer's advice, um, in fact, uh, uh, Mills and Reeves' advice, who we used, uh, was to um, have a sale and purchase agreement. And so formally, for that sale and purchase agreement, where uh, we all signed it, um, where they gave us certain things, like the, uh, the permission to spin out, um, they gave us some intellectual property and they licensed other intellectual property to us, and in return, we gave them some equity in the company. And, um, it, it, it just seemed that you know, that was the right grouping and um, indeed it was to a certain extent the project team that we spun out to, to do CSR. First question on the point of control and costs. I think that maybe that this is a, a general point that, that you should think about when using lawyers or indeed using any professional services is you should treat your lawyers in exactly the way you treat your plumbers. So you wouldn't have a plumber come in, you know, fix your radiator and then send you the bill afterwards. You'd always ask for a quote. And all lawyers 
should give you an estimate before they start the work. It, it may only be a stage of estimate, you know, writing the first round of correspondence and drafting the first version of the agreement. But, but you know, it should not be an open-ended checkbook that you're handing your lawyer. So it's, you know, it's a two-way process. Um, you know, for example, you, you could say to them, well, okay, you've quoted me X, but at the moment I only want to spend Y. So if, if, you know, if you're getting up towards Y, then can you let me know, because then I need to reassess whether or not I want to take it further. So, so as I say, it, it's, you know, it, you can control costs, um, obviously, at the end of the day, some lawyers are more expensive than others, and you, know, you, you get to pay for it, you know, it's a service like anything. So, so that's, um, I hope, helpful with the first thing. Always ask. Don't be afraid to ask. If, if a lawyer won't tell you how much they charge per hour, then, or, or how much the job is likely to cost, then, yeah, go and ask someone else. And particularly around here, where there's a lot of experience, uh, lawyers helping small companies, lawyers will often um, hesitate to say as a, as a lost leader, um, where they uh, uh, are interested in getting involved with a company that they think has a future, will be very cost effective um, in what they charge on the basis of um, as that company increases in size, they will earn more fees later on. And uh, around Cambridge is a great place um, to, to do lawyering because there are a good number of them, and I guess there's competition as well, which helps yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. that's, that's a very good point. I think the thing is there are standard agreements when you get it together to form a company like, um, as well as mentioned, service agreements, uh, directors and uh, agree uh, uh, employment agreements for staff and indeed investment agreements. If you think that you need very much more to control uh, the actions of some of your um, co-workers or co-founders, I think you want to think about whether you actually get on well with those people. And because you'll be living very closely with them for the next five to ten years, you know, do you really want to do that? No, I, that's one of the advantages of having nine people. Um, the, the six engineers um, primarily took the word, you know, for, um, a couple of us um, directors, co-founders, who indeed spent a good proportion of our time reading the agreements and making sure we understood them and taking legal advice and even, you know, second opinions. And because we um, were on exactly the same wavelength as our co-founders, you know, we're all pointed at the same um, sort of goal in the future. Um, you know, they took our word for it, and that they were able to get on and do the engineering. So yeah, that's how it worked. Yeah, I think it, it could well be a factor. And at the moment, we're in a slightly different difficult position because. Those duties aren't going to come into force, I think, until early 2008. Um, and the, the government is going to provide um, and publish more guidance on what is actually meant by that, apparently, in the run this year. So that, that might help us. But I think that's a very good point. If you had a director who clearly was incompetent in certain of those areas, then it is going to be very difficult to show that he had, you know, that he was promoting the success of the business. One of the things we'll be looking to people like Mills and Reef to advise on, you know, if there's a two metres of documents, okay, but what are the important ones and what do we need to take account of? Because you certainly don't want to be reading two metres of document yourself. Yeah. And the answer, I think, is, you know, quite a lot of it probably is not relevant, but um, only time will tell, I guess, with case precedent. Yeah. The question is, you know, do we actually need that? Is anything broke? Why do we need two metres of the new companies act? I don't know. Mm. Oh, that's Enron. The shadow of Enron. That's why they're all coming over here, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Mm. And again, it's another sort of um, uh, issue that came out of the whole sort of corporate collapse scandal of Enron. Uh, the way that we've interpreted it in the UK is um, to ensure that companies have non-executive directors on their boards who can sort of, if you like, keep a, keep a, a controlling eye and fill in your views on some non-executive directors. Um, yeah, from an early stage of CSR we had uh, non-execs, 
Um, uh, and you should act as if it had value to the business. And uh, you know, know something about your business, or know some, understand how a company should present itself in the city. And those are the, uh, the, the key things. And of course, as companies become public, there are all sorts of uh, Capri and Greenbury guidelines as to how boards should be constituted. But it, it, it isn't something that you should get overly concerned about, so that's my view. <coughs>
you wouldn't be selling that package to other people. So yeah. the whole limits of what your rights are and what my rights are would be fuzzy. But as I say, that's only in the situation where you pay the money. So if you don't pay me any money at all, then you know, courts would say, well, uh, sorry, <laughs> why should she give you that IP? So as I say, it's even more important. You must you must get it agreed before the work starts. Basically, like just that. a simple agreement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even I, mean, I wouldn't recommend this, but even if it was an exchange of emails that made it clear that the, 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 that your intention and their intention was that everything that came out of that relationship was owned by you, then that that would be sufficient evidence in an ideal world you'd be looking for. Yeah, a, a manufacturing agreement or you know, never a particular outsourcing or a consultancy agreement. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, the more evidence that you've got that that's what the parties agreed, that in the better position you would be in. Because otherwise, you don't want to get in the position of you know, five years later saying, well, actually, I quite like that IP now. Have you? Can I have it, please? PCT, um, Patent Cooperation Treaty, is, is a money saving uh, mechanism, if you like. Instead of having to go to every single country in the world and apply for a patent, you start off your patent application in, say, the US or the UK or Europe, and then you have a certain period of time um, whilst, whilst you develop your invention, whilst you develop the product, whatever it is. Um, and after that period of time, you can then decide whether you want to expand it into the countries of the PCT. So it, it can, like, it, it's a breathing space before deciding whether or not to lash out on spending patent fees in a large number of companies. So it's, it's a very good device and, and one that's used frequently by companies. And you've got to bite the bullet. The, the, the P, going the PCT route at least enables you to defer the fees for as long as you reasonably can. But the, there isn't a short, there isn't a way to save money. I mean, it, it's one of the really um, problematic sides of patenting that it is expensive, and the, the only way to do it is to try and get investment at an earlier stage. But that, you know, that's easier said than done, really. I'm afraid there's no magic wand there. Um, what you have to remember, of course, is that there are different between venture capitalists and uh, corporate investors. A venture capitalist is primarily concerned with the use of capital, and the best use of capital to invest in your company in order to uh, increase the size of that capital. Um, a corporate investor is interested in investing your company. Quite often, um, it's, a, it's a side objective to make money. I mean, nobody wants to lose it. So Intel, for example, and Sony and Philips and um, Siemens and others invested in CSR as corporate investors. Um, but our objective, and their objective, was to work with them uh, in order to develop technology that could be used in their products. And we didn't do special projects. Um, I mean, we were developing Bluetooth chips, standard chips that we would sell to everybody. So, in fact, one of the uh, intellectual property agreements uh, we had with one of those um, corporates was perhaps one of the biggest documents um, that we developed. Um, and that was to say, well, look, you know, who owns the intellectual property as we go along? Um, bear in mind that CSR, when it develops its chips, is going to sell those on the open market. What it would be prepared to do is to allow that to other corporate investors a little lead time. Um, with those chips to get their products out to market first. So the objectives are different and mainly you'll end up working with um, the product developers and the people perhaps in the research labs rather than the financiers. Um, but they're very complementary. Um, so I would say that um, corporate investors are um, actually just as important um, as VCs, but they're different. Yeah, I've not got very much to add on what Phil said, other than the fact that but the whole problem with the BC is you know, this concept of looking for potentially an early exit. Um, in both cases, 
what I would say is it's very worth taking advice before you sign the heads of terms. One of the problems that we frequently see is that people sign heads of terms, the, the, the outline bullet point for the deal. They sign them because they're not binding, they're not really binding, they think, oh wow, then it goes down the line and we, we can always change our mind. But although they're not legally binding, it's very difficult to negotiate yeah. Yeah. away from that position. That, so, it's a very, very important point. The VCs will say, uh, perhaps, um, this is a light and easy document, it's only two pages, there are 20 bullets in it which will define the way that we will develop our investment agreement with you. Um, but as soon as you sign something like that, even though it might not be legally binding, you start to go down a certain path. So that actually is the stage when you should get legal input at that very, very beginning, rather than waiting until you have to develop a more weighty uh, investment agreement. Yeah.